All right, we are going to continue forward. We just started last week a sermon series in the Ten Commandments. And so, again, for those of you who are good at math, we are on number two since we started last week. All right, so we're going to turn to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, we're going to be reading verses four through six. Let me say a quick word of prayer for us coming to the Lord and hearing his word. Lord, we thank you that you desire to speak, to encourage, to correct, to provoke, because you love us. Lord, may we encounter you afresh through your word today, in Jesus' name, amen. Exodus chapter 20, verses four through six, the second commandment. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments." This is God's word. You might not be able to figure this out, but I was a handful for my parents. So if you're a mama with a rambunctious, energetic, um, always getting into trouble young person, um, just think about me. I mean, I, I turned out okay. Um, in, fact, in fact, my parents, they called me Destructo. My dad, that was his moniker for me. I was the youngest of four. My, my siblings were all teenagers when I was born, so my parents were tired. They were just tired, so, you know, I had a, I had a few steps on them. Um, there was one particular time I was, I think it was in kindergarten, on the blacktop before school started, and, um, you know, I loved kung fu, okay? Um, and so I, uh, I, just started, I decided, that, I don't know how this all kind of happened, but a friend and I, we just started, we're kung fu fighting each other on the blacktop, which draws a crowd. I don't know if you've ever tried that, but you'll draw a crowd. If you do kung fu fighting, like out on the quad or something like that, people will want to watch. Um, and so soon enough, there's a circle of kids and there's growing and it's like, whoa, I got a lot of attention doing this here. Of course, we weren't actually hitting each other, but we're making all the noises and we're doing the kicks and the hits and things like that. And, and so the influence of that for me was my dad and I, sometimes on Saturday nights, I think it was, we would watch kung fu movies or shows. Do you guys remember those? I mean, the ones where it's like the English dub. So the, word, the mouth's going one direction, but the words are going in a different direction. Hey, you, come over here. You know, those. Do you remember that? So I used to love that. And so anyways, that was my influence, and it landed me in the principal's office that particular morning, and I realized, okay, maybe not a good idea. For a kid, the influences of, you know, television, pretty benign. But for adults, when television or other medium influence you in the choices that you make, the lifestyle that you live, it could be very destructive. I remember my wife and I, Becca, we were ministering to a Barnard college student, Barnard's a part, the women's college, a part of Columbia University. And there was a certain TV show, I won't even tell you the name of it because it wouldn't edify you. But she said that she and her friends, they would watch this show, it's a show on cable, it was very popular a while ago. And she said that they tried to live out the lives of these characters on, sh on TV. And it framed <laughs> womanhood and sexuality in a way that was widely destructive. So much so that she was in a relationship that was abusive. Um, essentially, there were some things that her, the person she was with, or he was doing that were illegal. But he would told her, you can't tell anyone or I'm going to hurt you. Right? So, 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 so how, did, how did that happen? How did she end up there? How, how did this sort of playing out a role on a show land her in such a scenario. This, the scripture here, the second commandment, it actually 
it tells us that. It tells us that the influences of culture, of the world, of our own heart, and even of the demonic all play a role in pulling us away from God, these idols, the idolatry of our life. And so today's message is titled, Don't Serve Idols, Serve the Lord. Don't serve idols, serve the Lord. If you wanted to rephrase the second commandment, you could phrase it that way. And here are three points that we're going to talk about here in the text that are just going to help us to understand what the, what the command of God is saying. Number one, the nature of idolatry. Secondly, the, the falsehood of idolatry. Thirdly, the love and grace of the Lord by contrast. So the nature of idolatry, the falsehood of idolatry, the love and grace of the Lord. Last week, we talked about how the moral law, the Ten Commandments, we need it because it shows us how to live justly. Otherwise, we live in the sort of milieu of, of relativism. Well, there's your way, there's my way. Well, how do we judge? How do we say, why do we, how can we say the war in, in, in Ukraine is bad? There has to be a higher law that's, that's, that transcends humanity. God's law, the Ten Commandments, it offers us that. Um, Martin Luther King Jr., we, we said how in his letter from Birmingham jail, he said, how do I know a law is unjust? He says, because I can appeal to a higher law, God's law. The Ten Commandments does that. It is the manner by which we as Christians have a moral foundation. In fact, every moral imperative of the New Testament, you could trace its roots back to the Ten Commandments. And last week we talked about making God's first. Today we're going to talk about living justly before our triune God by not serving idols and serving him. So the nature of idolatry. Notice how there's three imperatives that God gives in the Ten Commandments. And it's just helpful to remember, these are God's words. This originated from him. It was given to his covenant people after he has shown his grace in delivering them out of slavery. Just like for believers, after we've been delivered out of the slavery of sin, God gives us his word to say, follow me, obey my commands. In verse four, the first imperative, don't make an idol. Don't craft one. We, we, we think about how, as modern folks, it seems so distant. These primitive folks, they would make something out of wood, maybe have some ritual around that. And then that was attached to some higher force or power that would bless them or affect their sense of self-worth. But as modern folks, that's not that distant. I mean, think about it. If you were to have a conversation with an ancient person and you were to tell them, yeah, I pulled this thing out. It's, it's, not, it's, it's man designed, made by robots. It's not made out of wood, but it does have plastic and other metals and some glass. And I touch it and I look at it and I swipe it and it impacts my sense of value if I'm on checking my Bitcoin or my, I don't have Bitcoin. I'm saying for your sake, not mine. Um, you know, my stocks, I'm checking my status on Facebook, who said they, they like what I've stated. I'm looking on Twitter, you know, whatever it is, I'm checking my email, whatever it is, your emotions, your countenance rises or falls based on what shows up on this screen. Isn't it true? So how different is it? How distant are we? Not that distant, not that different from a hand-carved piece of metal or wood that we get a sense of worth or security or salvation from. God says, don't make idols. The second and the third imperatives are don't bow to them. Verse five, don't serve them. So three imperatives. Why three imperatives? Why does God give three imperatives around idols? In idolatry. Well, it's safe to assume you can end up in idolatry even if you don't make one, right? Like even if you didn't, it, otherwise he would just say, don't make idols. Like if it was just as simple as only people who are idolatrous are the ones that make them, he would just, that would cover the bases. 
There's more to it than that. What is the nature of idolatry? Well, the nature of idolatry is, is, is somewhat dimensional, multidimensional. If you were to turn with me, and if you don't turn, it's on the screen. 1 John 5, verse 21, the last scripture of 1 John. The very last thing that he says. He says, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Now, time has, has elapsed significantly from Mount Sinai, God giving the Ten Commandments, and John writing this epistle probably the last decade of the first century. Yet the content is the same. Don't serve idols. And if you were to study further, if you look in throughout John and everything that he said in 1 John up to this point, he hasn't even talked about, about idols. Why is this the last thing? Well, if you dig a little deeper, what you recognize is that John is giving us a microcosm of what scripture gives us throughout its canon, that idolatry has three points of origin. John talks about in chapter two, he says, don't love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the father, the love of the father is not in him. The world is one of those points of origin. The world that he means is not like physical earth, but he means the world system, the way that the world does things. This, this girl that Becca and I, we were ministering to, which thankfully, by the way, she subsequently renounced those ways and, and came to serve Jesus. And she wrote us a letter later on um, after she had moved. But the way she ended up in this idolatry is, well, the world offers it to you. It's pervasive. This is a point of access. Not to say that phones are intrinsically evil, but certainly a point of access to a lot that the world offers comes through our technology, our screens. The world is a point of origin of idolatry, but it's not just the world. It's our own hearts. John talks about how it's the desires of the flesh that we're to turn away from. See, idolatry only works as there's a hook inside your heart. There's a desire that you have for, I want salvation in this thing or that thing in personal wealth, personal beauty. I want the sense of security of affirmation or fill in the blank. There's something in our hearts, but it's not just the world and it's not just our hearts. John says, and if you read throughout scripture, it would say the same thing. There's also this demonic influence. In chapter three of verse, of first John, in, in verse seven, he says, little children, let no one deceives you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. So we see that idol the nature of idolatry has three points of origin. It's, there's a demonic, there's a cultural, sociological, peer pressure. I mean, this, this, this college student, it wasn't just that she desired to follow in these ways. It was her friends encouraging and egging each other on. Hey, we're going to live this way. But it's also in our hearts. And so if we're going to have an honest conversation about idolatry, we have to give credence to all three of those points of origin. To not make idols, to not bow down to them, to not serve them. There is an internal psychological lust of the flesh. There's a sociological cultural influence from the world. And there's a root that's certainly from Satan himself. The point of idolatry, then, if you look at all three points of origin, it's, it's to give you a counterfeit of the actual experience of worshiping God. It's to give you, um, it's actually to rob God of his true glory by making something else your savior, something else your Lord or your king. David Paulison says that the alternative to Jesus, he wrote, a, he wrote an article called Idols of the Heart and Vanity Fair. He says that the alternative to Jesus, the swarm 
of alternatives, whether approached through the lens of the flesh, world, or evil one, is idolatry. That is the nature of it. So if that is the nature of idolatry, you know, what really pulls us into it? What does it offer or what is it when it's exposed? Our second point, the falsehood of idolatry. Everything about idolatry is false. It presents itself a certain way, but when you are drawn into it, it's exposed for something different. And in some cases, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's, you know, maybe it's your career, you know, like, okay, I'm going to serve that. And, you know, I I remember talking to uh, one of our ministry partners who lived in North Carolina and their family uh, had a few kids. And she was just talking about how God is not like Molech. Molech was this, this pagan God in the Old Testament. And the way that the pagan nations would worship Molech was by throwing their children into the fire. Which seems like, well, why would you ever do that? But she was saying to Becca and I, you know, she was trying to make some decisions about her schedule and her life and her career and her husband was working and all that. And she says, you know, I realize God's not like Molech. He's not calling me to sacrifice my kids just to serve him, right? So so there's a sense of a falsehood that's, a substitute for God. But sometimes, stay with me here, sometimes idolatry is actually us thinking that we are worshiping God. And here's what I mean. Maybe you're familiar with the story, but if you were back in Exodus, in Exodus 32, while Moses is still on the mountain talking to God, the people in their impatience are like, Okay, Aaron, you're number two, do something. We want you to make gods to represent, to go before us. And Aaron's like, all right, somehow he had a plan. Like, it just like, he was ready for that. Um, Give me all your medals, you know, gold and all that stuff. I'll I'll figure this out. And and he says in in verse four, he received the gold from their hand, fashioned it into, uh, with a graving tool, made a a golden calf. And they said, and, and they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The idolatry wasn't that they went out and they found a different God. The idolatry was that they made something and they said, this is God. Look at him. He's a calf. You know, he's a bull. You know, maybe source of strength. I don't know why they picked a calf. But it was actually saying this represents God. In Exodus 20, God's saying to his people, it's not just don't make idols or don't make objects. He's saying, don't make anything in verse four that carries a likeness of anything in heaven or anything in the earth or anything in the water. Why? He says, because the reason is God is an invisible God and anything we create to liken him falls way short falls way short. Even, if his, even in its majesty, even in its power, even in its glory, it falls way short. How is this relevant for us? Well, first of all, we have to acknowledge that God's invisibility certainly can be a challenge. In fact, it could be an area where we can have doubt. Well, I can't see him. So how do I know he's there? How can I trust him? And how do I know he's real? How do I know my faith is actually real? Well, God in his sovereignty, his glorious plan, he purposefully does not allow us to see him. He purposefully reveals himself through his word and not through visual, right? We, some say what we learn 80% through visual, God, he calls us to learn about him and to worship him predominantly through words, 
culturally, I mean, they're, 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 we, we live in a space with entertainment and there's all types of in, images and we're driven by images. And sometimes even we think in a church service, it could be tempting. Hey, we need to include more of this stuff. That's where we're going as a culture. But God says, I, that's not how you worship me. So, so, so idolatry is actually worshiping God the wrong way. Like he's given us ways to worship him. And if we say, you know, maybe we should do this to worship God. Maybe we should do that. It's, it's, it's the, that's actually idolatry. So Jesus, um, or actually in first Peter, we have a, let me illustrate this. In first Peter one, eight and nine, Peter is talking to believers He says that they're like exiles living in Babylon. They're about to be, uh, incur a tremendous persecution under Nero, Emperor Nero. And he's acknowledging the fact they can't see the Lord, yet they are worshiping him. And he says this in 1 Peter 1, 8 and 9, it's going to be on the screen. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him, Now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with a joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. What is Peter saying? Peter, who himself saw the Lord, saw him transfigured on the mountain of transfiguration, saw him crucified and raised from the dead, is ministering to believers who've never seen Jesus, just like you and I. And he acknowledges, you haven't seen him, but you love him. You're you're relying not on something visual. You're relying on the testimony of the apostles and the word of the scripture. God's revelation of himself, it comes to you by words, not by vision. Visuals. So, you know, in our, in our day, there's, there's some, some false piety out there that would say, well, you, you need to imagine God like he's, like this, and he's running to you, you know, Jesus is running to you. Scripture says, no, you don't need that. You need to trust his word. When we think about how we come together, we just need to have more, you know, entertaining things. We need to have more things that would be, you know, visual. No, we don't need that. We just need to trust the word of God. And lastly, just if we think about false ways of worship equal idolatry, as I was praying, I thought about for many of us, we think of God as being the one who requires accomplishment over intimacy. Like I, got, I, I just got to do more. In a, and the way we get there is lots of different ways. Maybe it had to do with our upbringing or maybe it has to do with our personality or maybe we're, You know, we didn't get the affirmation from mom or dad. And so we're thinking we got to get that from the Lord. And so we figure he's a God who just, he's always wanting us to do, 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 but never have intimacy. That's not the ways of God. So the nature of idolatry, it has three different origins. The falsehood of idolatry, it could be either substituting something for God or having a wrong view of God. Now let's consider the love and grace of the Lord. God's love, his grace, it actually contrasts idols. And here's what I mean. I've, I've quoted this man before. He's not a Christian, but he, was in, or he lived in Urbana, grew up here. David Foster Wallace. And he gave this commencement speech and he talked about idols. Well, he didn't say that. He talked about worship. He talked about how everybody worships. And here's what he says about essentially what idols do. He says, if you worship money and things, if they are, if you worship if these things, trying to get some kind of real meaning in life, then you'll never have enough right? Like if you worship money, you'll always feel poor. You'll always feel like I don't have enough. It's it's still unstable. I need more. I need to push harder. I need to get more. I need to cut more corners. He says, if you worship your own body and beauty, you will always feel ugly 
And when time and age start showing, you'll die a million deaths before they finally put you in the ground. So if you worship money, you're going to feel poor. If you worship beauty, you'll feel ugly. If you worship power, you'll feel weak and afraid, and you will need ever more power over others to keep that fear at bay. If you worship your intellect, being seen as smart, you will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out, and so on. I think we've lived long enough to attest that that's true. That's true, isn't it? That's the nature of idols. That's what they do. If you serve an idol, if you worship an idol, if you bow down, if you make one, Scripture says you become like them. That's what they do for you. But what does God do if you worship him? Verse 6, it says of Exodus 20, 5 and 6, he, gives us, he tells us why we shouldn't worship these things. He says, I'm a jealous God. I visit iniquity on the, father, you know, the children to the fourth, third and fourth generations. In other words, he's just, he judges. But notice how it's not parallel in verse six. But showing steadfast love to thousands. Thousands of what? Thousands of generations of those who love me and keep my commands. Now, what does that all mean? It actually, it's a tricky verse. The visiting iniquities piece is actually hard to translate. And probably what we could most, most safely say is that what, what God is saying is that for those, oftentimes one generation to the next follow the same idolatrous patterns, worshiping the same things. Grandfather worshiped money. The son does and the grandson does, that sort of thing. And therefore each one is responsible. It's not saying, it's not saying, it's clearly not saying that the grandkids are paying for the sins of the grandfather. That's not what it's saying. Scripture clearly says that everyone um, is judged for his own sin. But so there's some type of passing along of idolatry that happens. And, and God is saying, I am just and I judge. And that is good. We want God to be just and judge. Because if in this world, if the way it's in all of its craziness, if all there is is everybody just gets a pat on the back, that's messed up, right? You want there to be justice. God gives that unquestionably. But see his love and his grace. He says, for those that obey me, I pour out my steadfast love generation after generation. Not a merited love. This is his covenant love. In fact, that word, that steadfast love, if you're ESV, I mean, it, it renders it in different ways in different translations. Consistently does so in the ESV, but it, the Hebrew is hesed, God's hesed. It's his covenant love. It's the love that Jesus poured out for you on the cross. It's the love that, it, the, that Romans 5, Paul, Paul says in Romans 5, that was poured into your hearts by the Holy Spirit. It's God's covenant love for you. It's poured out that God says, ultimately his desire, his desire is to bless you. His desire is to draw you in. His desire is to have intimacy with you. If you worship an idol, you're just going to feel like you're always behind, always falling short, never good enough. But if you worship the Lord he pours out a love for you that you could never earn, never deserve. And it's never exhausted. It never ends. It says that in Psalm 103 that he removes our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. God's mercy, it's actually hard to describe it, but God's mercy outweighs God's mercy for his people and his grace outweighs his judgment. God's definitely a judge and he is definitely just, but the text is pushing us to understand something about God. He's not 50, 50. He's like God's, or, or maybe we view God. He's just ready to strike me. That's not his nature. If we were to think so, we would be thinking wrongly about God. We should think as he's revealed to us in his word. 
He shows his steadfast love to thousands of generations of those that love him and keep his commandments. The hallmark of Christianity, 1 Thessalonians 1, last text, it'll be on the screen. 1 Thessalonians 1, the hallmark of Christianity, or one of the hallmarks, I should say, is we have a very robust faith that cannot be summarized in just a few words. Paul says this to the Thessalonians. He says that, For not only has the word of the Lord sounded, he talks about how it's, it goes forth um, in everywhere and they have no need to say anything for they themselves, other folks, the other places, verse nine, report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and wait for the son, his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. Christianity is about turning from idols. It's about turning from dead things that off that, that, that sort of promise salvation. They sort of promise security. They sort of promise hope and in beauty and in affirmation and all of these things in comfort, but yet they, they rob you. They enslave you. And, and, and Christianity is turning from those things to serve the living God and to wait for the one who has revealed to us the image of God himself, Jesus Christ, to return, to make us whole. And so this morning on Mother's Day, God's word encourages you to be aware of the idols of your heart. What are you naturally inclined towards? We all have points of vulnerability. We all have something that we buy into or things that we can buy into. Be aware of that. But not only of your own heart, be aware of the idols of if you're, you know, in certain disciplines at the university or certain career fields, they all have their own idol packages. You got to be aware of that. The idol of, of where we live. I mean, for some of you, you're graduating, you're going to move to another city. It's going to be different. There's different idols depending on where you are. Paul went to Athens. He said he was, he was, um, he, he was just despising how, how many different idols there were. It just, it, it bothered him. It, depending on where you are, it's different. You have to be aware. You have to be aware. We have to be aware of the enemy and his schemes. You need to be aware. You need to trust in the revelation that God has given us of himself through his word, that it is sufficient. We don't need other things that could stand in substitute for him as a representative. We need him as he's revealed himself. And lastly, you don't need to make idols because God's already put his image in the world. He did that in you. He put his image in you. And he's called you as a believer to be transformed daily into more of his likeness, that you would be his representative in the earth. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your encouragement this morning. I pray, God, that you would stir our hearts, that you would help us not to be neurotic navel gazers thinking about our idols, but that we would be hopeful believers who are able to repent and trust in your grace. Lord, that as you promise to deliver us, you certainly will. We ask your blessing God, just over what you've spoken to us, that we would continue to live out of that. In Jesus' name, amen.